The True Worship, by J. S. Blackburn. Chapter 2, The Bible Words and Their Meaning. Five times in the Revelation John records a moment of ecstatic climax, when the dwellers in heaven, seeing the things of earth in the light of heaven, prostrate themselves in the presence of God's throne. And in this act symbolize their worship. In the introductory vision of God on his throne, twenty-four elders are seen, clothed in white, wearing golden crowns and seated each upon his throne. At moments of climax in this tremendous vision, the thanksgiving of the cherubim, the lamb taking the book out of the right hand of God, the appearance in heaven of the vast crowd of the redeemed. The arrival of the world kingdom of God and his Christ, and the overthrow of Babylon, the false church, they suddenly rise from their thrones. Fling themselves on their faces before God's throne and cast their crowns before him. Thus dramatically and symbolically they take an attitude intensely expressive of their recognition of the supreme greatness of God relative to themselves and seen by themselves. Their attitude expresses their acknowledgement of the rightness of the fact that all blessing, all honor, all glory, all power is in the hand of God, while they themselves hide their faces in the dust. The scene described exactly presents the meaning of the Bible word basic to our theme, proskuneo. Its simple original meaning is to prostrate oneself before another, and for the purpose of this study we shall use the English word worship as the exact equivalent of the New Testament word proskuneo. Perhaps the Hebrew word used in the Old Testament had primary reference to the bodily attitude described. But in the setting of John chapter 4 we may simply begin with the thought that worship is an attitude of spirit, taken by man realizing the presence of God revealed. In the true worship in spirit and in truth, the worship of the Father, warm and living overtones of love and relationship are added to this basic thought, but here is our beginning. The concept which clearly differentiates worship from thanksgiving, praise, prayer, or service, but indicates also how closely related are each of these actions. We can thank, praise, or serve an equal, but worship is due to God alone. When we do thank, praise, or serve him, while there is in these actions addressed to God an element of recognizing his greatness and awful glory. This element is not the central purpose and content of these actions as it is in the case of worship. Perhaps at this point reference should be made to those minor and subsidiary cases in which worship is addressed to men. In addressing the mayor as, your worship, we know very well that worship belongs to God alone. This is a minor, archaic, and exceptional usage. So it is in scripture. Those cases in which it is doubtful whether the speaker in the Gospels really intended to attribute deity to Jesus are examples of this kind. In the parable of the two debtors, the first debtor, fell down and worshipped the king. Here the expression is evidently equivalent to, did homage. The full New Testament significance is clear in the last chapter of the Revelation. John is twice moved to fall down and worship the angel who explained to him the vision. He is quite sternly forbidden, and the angel's injunction, worship God, obviously means that worship is due to God alone. It has already been remarked that all this is closely paralleled by a consideration of the principal Old Testament word signifying worship. There is the same emphasis on the bodily posture as in the Revelation, and the images of that book find many parallels in the Old Testament. Abraham's nameless servant bowed his head and worshipped, and also Moses, Exodus chapter 34 verse 8. Joshua, realizing the presence of God in the vision of the warrior with drawn sword, fell on his face, and did worship. Thus, our first light on the nature of worship comes from the root meaning of the Bible words employed. We have by this been led to see that, whatever may have to be added by later considerations, the primary thought in worship is that of man, often at special moments of vision. Taking in heart and spirit an attitude of acknowledgement of the worship of God as at the time revealed and known. We shall see how, in the true worship, which is the worship of the Father revealed in the Son. This is the adoring recognition and appreciation of all the treasures of the divine love vouchsafed by the Spirit to the believing heart. The sentences in which the Samaritan woman introduced the subject take us a step further in our search for the meaning of worship. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, she said, as the conversation proceeded, and ye say, that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. 
Some have considered that she was taking evading action as a defense against an assault on her conscience. That her conscience was reached there can be no doubt, but the serious way her words were taken up by the Lord and the literally epoch-making import of the revelations given her. Leave no doubt of her sincerity, and indeed that the searching, all-seeing eye of Jesus saw, not only a conscience aroused, but also the awakening of a new life in her which could receive and in the end would understand something of the meaning of his answers. In the interchange of question and answer, as he spoke the burning words revealing the Father's quest, the well of water in her, so newly given, was indeed springing up into everlasting life. The sentences imply a particular picture intended by the word worship. The Lord took up her statements and added to them. Whatever worship is, the true worship of the future would be in spirit and in truth instead of, in this mountain, or, at Jerusalem, and it would be addressed to God under his true name. The Father, instead of his earlier name, Jehovah. For the moment, however, our concern is with the light here cast on the real meaning of worship. There is not a word to imply that the Lord disagreed with the meaning she had in using the word. What was that meaning? Or, to frame the question in another way, what did take place, in this mountain, and, in Jerusalem? She called it worship, and the Lord agreed that it was so. The opening of the Gospel of Luke contains some delightful specimens of story-telling. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Arbia. And it came to pass, that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into Jehovah's temple. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of Jehovah standing on the right side of the altar. The purpose of the narrative is, of course, to tell what the angel said and its results. But a most interesting light is cast upon what took place, at Jerusalem, and which both the Samaritan woman and the Lord named worship. Note the elements composing the scene, a priest and the priest's office. Incense, the temple, the altar, and all in honor of Jehovah. The twenty-four courses of the priesthood, of which the course of Abia or Abijah, was the eighth, were instituted by David, as recorded in 1 Chronicles 24. In the Gospel times each course exercised the priest's office in the temple of the Lord for one week at a time, and each day's services were taken by one or more families of the course. On any particular day, for both the morning and evening sacrifices, four lots were cast and by these the individual priests were chosen to prepare the altar, to kill the sacrifice, to offer the incense, and finally to burn the sacrifice on the altar. The third lot, to offer the incense, was the most coveted and could fall to any priest only once in his lifetime. This was the lot which fell to Zacharias on that great day when the angel of the Lord appeared and spoke to him about the birth of John Baptist. For our present purpose, we must note that, though the reference to a sacrifice is not explicit, the word, lot, inescapably includes in the scene the sacrifice which had just been killed and was about to be burned on the altar. There is no direct scripture evidence regarding the Samaritan worship, in this mountain, Mount Gerizim. For two hundred years a temple stood there in which the Pentateuchal system of sacrifices was carried on by a Samaritan priesthood. This is doubtless the worship to which the woman referred, although it has been thought that she was speaking about Abraham and Jacob, both of whom erected altars and offered sacrifices at Shechem or Succor. It is thus clear that in the phrases, our fathers worshipped, and, men ought to worship, the word worship is equivalent to a system of priesthood and sacrifice. And so also the Lord employed it when he went on to describe the true worship. Exactly similar further considerations apply to the usual Old Testament word for worship and its meaning. Abraham said to the young men who had so far accompanied Isaac and himself, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. And come again to you. What was intended by Abraham's word, worship, is immediately apparent. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand, and a knife, and they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and took the ram, and offered him up for a burnt offering. 
Sir Abraham returned. The New Testament and Christian counterpart of this meaning which we have now reached is given in 1st. Peter chapter 2 verse 5. It is one of the great scriptures dealing with the true worship and must have the closest attention later. For the moment it will suffice to quote it. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Here is the New Testament system of priesthood and sacrifice. The true worship in spirit and in truth. At this point let us summarize what we have learned about the central Bible word proskuneo, worship. From the word itself in derivation, the meaning is an attitude of mind, heart and spirit taken by man at the moments when he realizes the presence of God revealed. From a consideration of the use of the word in John chapter 4 and elsewhere, a greater precision of meaning emerges, and this is a system of priesthood and sacrifice. Brief mention must be made of other Bible words so closely akin to proskuneo that to omit them from our consideration would render it seriously incomplete. In the English Bible, latruo and latrea are sometimes translated worship. Fundamentally they mean serve and service, but certain examples show clearly that the service of the sanctuary is what is primarily intended. We have an altar, whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 10. They, serve him day and night in his temple, Revelation chapter 7 verse 15. Present your bodies a sacrifice, which is your reasonable service, Romans chapter 12 verse 1. The priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 6. This usage is so closely akin to proskuneo, likewise implying a system of priesthood and sacrifice, that we shall have occasion to refer to it again. One other Bible word will contribute to our study. Blessing, eulogia and eulogio, is often given a special meaning when addressed to God, and this meaning is nearly allied to worship and priestly service. The first Bible priest was Melchizedek, of whom we read in Genesis chapter 14. He came out to meet the victorious Abram, and not only blessed Abram, but also blessed God. This dual blessing, coming out from God to men, and then rising from men to God in response, is seen very beautifully in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. To bless means to speak good. God's speaking good regarding his people has enriched them beyond all man's golden dreams, it has given them all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Our speaking good to God cannot and does not enrich him, but such a response to God the Father from his children, answering to his love and giving him his true place, ever rises as a sweet savour to him. Blessing, in the special sense of rising from his children in response to the love of God the Father, is thus something very close to worship. In the Revelation, blessing ever rises in connection with the worship of those who, in heaven, prostrate themselves before him that sits upon the throne and before the Lamb.